is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Russia's defense minister visits troops in Ukraine in the first appearance since Evgeny Prigozhin demanded his removal as Moscow lifts counter-terror measures put in place during the short-lived meeting. Ukraine says Wagner mercenaries remain in the country after Prigozhin agrees to exile following an aborted uprising against Vladimir Putin. But there are a few signs of market turmoil amid contained moves in oil stocks and currencies after the weekend events in Russia, the ruble weakens, wheat gains. So let's take a look at the futures, or actually the markets. The futures in the U.S. pretty much flat to European stocks, down some three-tenths of eight percent. Look, the big question, the billion-dollar question, is why we're seeing so much calm in the markets after the pretty extraordinary weekend that we had in Russia. A couple of things that we need to watch out for. First of all, the focus firmly on what happens next. We don't know what kind of deal Prigozhin actually brokered with the help of Lukashenko with Vladimir Putin. The other question is, is this a clear advantage to Ukraine? It's probably too soon to tell, and we don't know whether this makes Vladimir Putin more unpredictable or not. For the moment, though, wheat stabilizing, oil stabilizing. We've also been speaking to a lot of traders who say, look, I just don't know how to trade it. They're figuring out what this means longer term, but there's not an actionable way of looking at some of these geopolitical risks. So Euro dollar 108.94, and you can see Brent crude pretty much unchanged at 73.99. We're also getting some Germany June EFO expectations. It'd be interesting to see whether it changes on the back of this pretty extraordinary uh, weekend. So it's coming in at 88, actually business confidence index coming in at 88.5. The estimate was 90.7. So we're seeing a bit of weakness across the board. And that's both, I think, for expectations, which are lower than expected, but also how they assess the current situation on the markets in Germany. The picture for euro dollar, you can see 108.95. And then we go to Sintra, Portugal for a full roundup and full conversations with a lot of central banks to try and figure out what inflation does from here on end. Now, Moscow has lifted counter-terror measures put in place during mercenary leader Evgeny Prigozhin's brief mutiny over the weekend. And Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoku, has visited combat troops in Ukraine in his first public outing since the weekend's dramatic events. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo. Maria, I mean, extraordinary weekend is probably an understatement. What does this crisis mean for Vladimir Putin? Is it over or is it just the beginning? And yes, Francine, and, and, and you mentioned at the top of the show, and this is something we should really focus on, this idea that uh, Sergei Shoigu, uh, the Russian defense minister, has magically reappeared this Monday morning. It was the first thing in the morning that we got from the Russian media outlets. And you see Shoigu on what appears to be a helicopter, and he is inspecting uh, troops uh, in this war in Ukraine. And the reason why this matters is because uh, we know very well that a lot of what happened over the weekend, really the, the core of the issue, uh, were the tensions between Prigozhin, Wagner, and obviously Shoigu and the MOD. Prigozhin was very critical in the way that the Russian army was fighting this war. This morning, it appears that the message the Kremlin wants to send to the world is that it is business as usual and that Shoigu is still very much in his job and now inspecting troops. Now, when it comes to Vladimir Putin, it's difficult to gauge because he's gone now radio silent. But uh, one of the fundamental things here, and it's really one of the big questions, is on the Saturday morning, he told the Russian Russian people, they were witnessing treason. He talked about fatal and critical consequences. He almost drew a parallel with 1917. That is a crucial moment in Russian history. And yet, on the Monday morning, Francine, no sight of Vladimir Putin. The charges of mutiny have been dropped on Wagner. Prigozhin allegedly is still alive and going to Belarus. What this means, what kind of deal was cut here, is still very, very unclear. The one thing I would say is that we just heard from the top European diplomat, uh, Giuseppe Borrell, who says Vladimir Putin created a monster and that monster has come back to haunt him. The image of Vladimir Putin as the all-powerful leader has been rattled by Prigozhin. Whether he stays in Russia or goes to Belarus, that impact has already happened. Yes, and, and what's incredible is actually, again, we're very, very thin on details. It's unclear why the mercenaries turned around. A lot of focus is on Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus and the role he played into all this. And you spoke to the opposition leader. So what did she tell you, Maria? 
Yes, and Alexander Lukashenko and Vladimir Putin have a history that goes back decades, and, and they also have a very transactional relationship at times. And we did speak to Svetlana Chikhanovskaya. She challenged uh, Lukashenko in the 2020 election, and what she said is, look, if you think that Alexander Lukashenko is the hero of the day and he's doing this for the good of his heart, uh, you're wrong. Let's take a look. Lukashenko is not a peacemaker. You know, he uh, mm -hmm. now presented as mediator in this uh, in this issue, but he was rather Putin's messenger. Uh, Lukashenko passed the message to Prigozhin, which allowed Prigozhin to stop uh, the match and save face. Somehow, I can say that Lukashenko saved Putin, but it doesn't make Lukashenko a hero, you know, in this situation. The problem is that the interests of Belarusians are not considered at all. And that was Svetlana Chikanuskaya. She is the opposition leader of uh, Belarus. And again, one thing that she reiterated is that the country, her country, Belarus, now finds itself in, in a rather dangerous position. On the one hand, you have uh, Lukashenko with a murky deal. The details are not clear. Prigozhin going that way, but also uh, the tactical nuclear weapons. Let's not forget that Vladimir Putin has said that he will station some more in Belarus. Maria, thank you so much, Maria, today out there in Brussels, of course, following this conflict from the very beginning. Let's also get more on what this all means for the future of the war in Ukraine. We're joined by our Mark Champion in Kiev. Mark, you have unparalleled insights into what this could mean for the you know, war going forward. It's extremely difficult at this point, given all of the questions that we still have to fully understand it. But what's been the reaction in Ukraine of Wagner's armed rebellion in Russia? Uh, well, it was very much welcomed. Um, the uh, basic uh, calculation in Ukraine is, is, is binary, really. Uh, anything that is uh, bad for the Kremlin, anything that is bad for Putin uh, should be good for Ukraine. Uh, the assumption is that this will, uh, they had hoped, obviously, that uh, you know this would continue and there would be more uh, destabilization in Moscow. Um, so uh, they're a little bit you know, more cautious now. Uh, but nevertheless, they still believe that uh, no matter what happens, uh, Putin has been weakened and that that should uh, help. Um, how exactly it will help, they don't know yet. Um, on the battlefield, we've seen uh, you know, really more of the same. We haven't seen any obvious linkage, uh, any impact uh, coming from the events of the weekend uh, onto the battlefield. Um, and the, the Ukrainians hope that in the longer term, this will... Uh, uh, create uh, uh, problems with morale, problems with command and control uh, in in uh, in the Russian forces. Um, yeah, but equally, there are you know Western diplomats here who also so uh, issue a word of caution, uh, which yeah. is that um, uh, we can't be sure uh, that the response to this won't be that Putin actually has to feels he has to kind of double down on the war. Right. Uh, Prigozhin, after all was demanding a, a, a more effective war, not a, uh, he, 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 he criticized the conduct of the war, he criticized the reasoning for the war, uh, but nevertheless he supported it and was asking for uh, a, a much tougher approach. But uh, very quickly, Mark, I mean, do we know what the deal is? Could it see, I mean, Prigoz President Prigozhin for the world means more instability and actually a, a far more, I guess, unstable and, and live wire than, than even President Putin is. So do we know what the agreement is? Will we know? And can Vladimir Putin really one day call him, you know, a, a treason and then the second day get, let him get away with it? Well, we don't know what the deal is. Um, uh, we, we really have no idea, to be quite frank. Uh, we don't know where Prigozhin is. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to his forces. Uh, there was some indication that uh, they were going to be given the opportunity to uh, sign contracts with uh, the, the regular military in Russia. Um, uh, but we don't know exactly. We don't know if what Wagner will continue uh, in the form that it has now. Uh, but what is clear that is that uh, Prigozhin felt the need to stand down. Uh, whatever the deal is, uh, it is not perfect for him. And he felt the need to stand down. And the, the likely reason for that is that although uh, the military, the Russian military, did not rush uh, to oppose him, uh, they also, even his friends in the military, uh, including one of the commanders in Ukraine, did not support him. So he may simply have decided that 4,000 or so troops was not enough.
All right, Mark, thanks so much. Mark Champion there in Kiev, Ukraine. Now, we're also joined by the Deutsche Bank chief economist, David Forkert's Landau. David, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Now, we're going to have a robust conversation on inflation, on U.S. recession, but actually it's unclear from a market perspective or an economist perspective to look at how these dramatic effects in Russia could change the war, could change wheat, and could actually change our world economy. Good morning, Francine. It's good to be here. Um, well, it's been a roller coaster weekend, uh, but by and large, today, as we see it this morning, um, it's a disaster averted in the sense that if uh, 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 Pyrshenko had been uh, successful um, in moving on to Moscow, you would then have an ultra nationalist with potential access to nuclear weapons, not necessarily, but potentially, and I think it would have been truly catastrophic. That's been averted. So, what we have now is a somewhat weaker. Uh, Putin, not not very much, not as much as some commentators indicated, but certainly we have some weaknesses here and there, and he will pursue the war in Ukraine as before, but there is some doubts. So I think on the whole, this morning we probably are in a better position than we were last Thursday because one thing has been removed, avoided, and uh, the main protagonist is weaker. So from that point of view, uh, I would expect it to be uh, quite positive once sort of markets feel their way through this to be positive. Uh, in the coming days. Does the change, I mean, I, you know, everybody cares about how this war ends and who wins. Does it actually have an impact on the economy of, of, of the world? And very indirectly. I mean, as you know, Russia didn't play that much of a role. Once we, once we worked our way through the gas problem and, uh, and the oil problem, uh, the rest of it wasn't that important. Um, but it does have an impact through defense stocks and generally through um, sort of a sentiment, uh, yeah. particularly among investors and among their uh, uh, firms. So in, in, there is a certainly a negative, indirect impact that we have seen, and it will continue to be there because it is an uncertainty. You have a, a land war in Europe with a nuclear power uh, with a guy who's, we don't quite know uh, how he might react in extreme situations. So. Um, David, we're lucky to have you today, actually, because you're great at thinking of, of different things. Or do you worry about where we are at this juncture in time for the world economy? Again, we look at policy from the Fed, we look at policy Bank of England and ECB, and I don't know whether a mistake could happen because they raised too quickly. Uh, no, I do not. Uh, unlike most of my profession, I tend to be fairly optimistic about uh, where the world economy is going. I believe that uh, the short term is an issue. Uh, in Europe and in the U.S. because we have to w work our way through the inflation problem uh, without causing a deep recession. Uh, but in the medium term, if you think two years ahead, uh, there's nothing but good news. We've seen the major technological innovation that is going to increase productivity. Uh, uh, and I would expect that if we were sitting here again three years from now, uh, uh, everything would look an awfully lot better than it is today. So from that point of view, yeah, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about where we're going in the, in the medium term. I know you have a, a pretty, uh, well, one of the most aggressive calls when it comes to recession in the U.S., which we'll talk about shortly. But are, are you not concerned or are you not perplexed at the fact that we managed to raise interest rates from, you know, 0, 0.5 or 1 percent to 4.5 percent without anything major breaking? Well, anybody who is perplexed about that probably doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> For all of those who have watched past cycles, uh, this is a totally unexpected world and, and, uh, and, and we don't really know exactly what's going on. Our, uh, so you have an unusually strong labor market. Let's look at the, the German unemployment rate. It's below 3 percent by OECD measures. And yet you have uh, core inflation being very sticky uh, with both the Fed and the ECB having gone up by a, a very significant amount in rates. And, uh, and, and we don't see as much of an impact or even close to what we would have expected. So yeah, I think perplexed is about the right word. Um, but I think it, It'll resolve itself. It's just take a lot more time. And there is scope for policy errors. There's scope for overshooting on the upside, uh, producing a recession that's deeper than it, than it would need to be. There's also scope for undershooting it and, and uh, keeping inflation and then having it feed into wages and producing a cycle. So um, this, is a, this is a very demanding period for uh, central bank policy making. <clears throat> All right, so David, thanks. If I might just add one thing. Yep. The one problem here is that you have the... the the fiscal monetary uh, uh, problem that we had in, in the five, eight years ago in reverse now. You have fiscal policy being very expansionary and monetary policy contractionary, and that isn't helping. So in some sense, monetary policy has to work a lot harder to get the fiscal stimulus down, uh, and, and that's a bit unfortunate. But
It is what it is. David, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. We're going to just pay for some, some hat and then come back. Deutsche Bank Chief Economist David Volkerts Landau, he stays with us. We'll talk not only, of course, about some of uh, what monetary policy can do to counter some of the fiscal policy, but also how traders should invest in this outlook. Coming up, we'll have plenty more at the Deutsche Bank Chief Economist. Also, we'll look at gold. we look at uh, some of the other things that we're watching out for in today's trading session. This is Bloomberg. back we talk about the economy and the intersection of the markets for the Deutsche Bank chief economist David Volkerts Landau who's still with us David thank you so much uh, for sticking around when you look at some of what you're expecting in terms of a US recession how does that compare with for example the European economy like I know they're in different cycles and of course they're reacting different to different monetary policy well the price dynamics in Europe is somewhat different uh, in the sense that uh, it's slower to catch up so prices will stay higher uh, inflation will stay higher and they're for longer. Uh, and what we see now is wage settlements feeding into that. Because basically, uh, wage settlements occur rather infrequently. And you want to catch up and bring real wages to where they were before the pandemic. And that's going to take a while. Now we see it moving in that direction. But it will take another couple of years before we get there. So I think from the, so the wage price dynamics, because of unionization is larger in, in, in the European sector, will be are a, a lot more detrimental to inflation will keep it higher uh, for longer so we believe that the ecb will probably uh, have to go to a four percent terminal rate uh, i know the market's betting on 375 but uh, four percent would not surprise me at all do, do you uh, worry about Ger germany actually in particular because of innovation but also uh, because of the proximity to the war uh, this is a real it's almost a you know, historic uh, uh, pivot in, in the sense that uh, uh, the Europeans and the Germans, Germans in particular, because of the large manufacturing sector, falling very much behind the U.S. Um, because of technological, the technological gap is getting wider and wider, very difficult to close, with generative AI now coming on top of that. But also the, the change in U.S. policy towards a very aggressive industrial policy, almost two trillion for, for, for the IRA and the, CHIP, and the CHIP Act and the Infrastructure Act. And we see very, very significant uh, plans for uh, the next wave of investment in, in sort of high-tech green industries moving from Europe into the U.S. Uh, the, 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 our sense is it's probably about 20 percent of uh, yeah. planning that was supposed to be in Europe for CapEx is going to move to the U.S. And that'll hurt. That'll hurt, that'll hurt uh, productivity. It'll hurt the outlook. So I think when you think in terms of problems, yes, I think the short term is, uh, uh, you know, one has to watch it, but it's manageable. But it's really the core issue right now in Europe and in Germany in particular is the, 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 the medium term outlook and how to overcome that. David, thanks so much. David Volkerts Landau, their Deutsche Bank chief economist. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets and we'll try and figure out how traders are gauging the impact of the Russian instability. We'll discuss that next. And this is Bloomberg. Investors have been assessing the implications of a dramatic challenge to Vladimir Putin's rule in Russia and the potential for further turmoil. Now let's get more on that market reaction with our Bloomberg M Live Van Ram. Van, thank you for joining us. Why are the markets actually so calm about it all? Is it because they don't know how to trade it or they're just waiting for news on the deal? Morning, Francine. I think that it is more like they're intrigued by what happened in Russia over the weekend and something that started in uh, and ended over the weekend, but they aren't necessarily priced much yet because they don't know how to price it. Uh, what is there to price is is the question that seemed to be dominant on traders' minds because, you know, as I said, the coup seems to have ended for now, and therefore um, there is not much of a visible pricing. We have seen a bit for gold, but if the situation in Kremlin is contained, as appears to be the case now, then those gains aren't very well founded. From a market's perspective, I would be concerned about what happens to natural gas prices, and that's aging higher slightly because of what it means to supply and the euro area inflation picture. But at the moment, the markets are thinking, well, if this is contained, 
then perhaps this is all we need to price in. So, Van, what does that mean going forward? I mean, what kind of asset class would you be looking at? I would be primarily looking at gold. If there is a protracted, uh, if there are protracted tensions around Kremlin, I think gold will see a bit. We have already seen gold march higher by a half a percent, and those gains can continue if if there is a protracted tension. tension. But of course, in, over the longer term, you you want to see how that is going to uh, play against the narrative where the Fed wants to keep going. All right, Ven, thank you so much, as always. Ven Ram there from our Bloomberg MLive team. Coming up this weekend, Vladimir Putin faced the biggest challenge to his two-decade rule. We'll discuss more with the former UK ambassador to Russia. Don't miss that. It's next, and this is Bloomberg. Russia's defense minister visits troops in Ukraine in his first appearance since Evgeny Prigozhin demanded his removal as Moscow lifts counter-terror measures put in place during the short-lived mutiny. Ukraine says Wagner mercenaries remain in the country after Prigozhin agrees to exile following an aborted uprising against Vladimir Putin. But there are a few signs of market turmoil amid contained moves in oil, stocks and currencies after the weekend events in Russia, the ruble weakens and weak gains. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, it's been a dramatic weekend after the impact of the Wagner mercenary group's advance towards Moscow, the biggest threat to Russian President Vladimir Putin's almost quarter-century grip on power. Now, for more on all of this, let's get straight to Bloomberg's Roz Matheson. Roz, thank you for joining us. You're, you always make sense of unexplicable events, and we saw probably the most dramatic events that not many people were expecting over the weekend. Like, what exactly did we just live through? Was it a mutiny to come to power? Did he retreat because he didn't have the, the, the capability of going to Moscow? Or did he really broker a good deal? Well, we're truly in a moment where there's just a lot we don't know. What we do know is that Prigozhin says that he did not want to topple Vladimir Putin. He was wanting the removal of the top commanders in Russia's military, particularly the defence minister, who's been very, very publicly critical of for months now so he wanted changes in the military establishment he didn't he said he didn't want to confront vladimir putin but vladimir putin said this is a mutiny against me really and so it did set them up for that showdown uh, it's unclear what happened really in the end with this deal that seems to be brokered by the belarusians like that enabled prigozhin to pull back his troops from moscow um, and pull them seemingly further back uh, into ukraine but the question is where is he now where are his men? Is he going to Belarus? And if so, what's he going to do there? What kind of arrangements were made behind the scenes that we simply just don't know about? Did he get some kind of understanding? We might yet see some changes in the Russian military establishment, perhaps in weeks or months from now. What was the trade-off? And if anything, what did also Vladimir Putin, if anything, get out of this moment? I mean, th this is what's kind of like eerily quiet almost, right? I mean, it's very uncharacteristic for Vladimir Putin not to come out today and, or, you know, certainly pardon Prigozhin, who also has been quiet. So what, I mean, the million dollar question is when do we find out? Mm -hmm. But I is it impossible also to, to tell at this point what happens next? Well, we may never know exactly what happened, but what we do know is you say there's been radio silence from both Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin mm -hmm. Today, the, the message from Russia and the Kremlin seems to be this happened, we'll move on, it's business as usual. We've got Shiogu in Ukraine, yeah. we've got fighting going on on the ground in Ukraine, Russian troops are still there, um, the streets of Moscow are back to normal, we've got markets are going to trade again, all the roadblocks have been removed, nothing to see here, here we go. And that seems to be what the state television, state media is pushing and perhaps again why Putin has not come out in public because he might feel that doing so suggests there's still more going on here and that seems to be really what the Kremlin is, is trying to do but the real question in the end is like 
despite this moment, even if things do quieten down, what does it mean for Vladimir Putin yeah. in the longer term? Yeah, 100% is the question that we're trying to find out. Ross, thank you so much. As ever, Ross Matheson there. Now let's also bring in Laurie Bristow, who was the UK's ambassador to Russia until 2020. So, uh, Ambassador Bristow, you know Vladimir Putin. I think you've negotiated with him. You know his inner thinking, his inner circle. H how did this weekend shape out? It's quite uncharacteristic for him to say, look, they're traitors, there's treason, and then forgive them. Yeah. Uh, good morning. It's really hard to make sense of what happened over the weekend. I mean, what Prigozhin thought he was doing? Was this a mutiny? Was it a, an attempted coup? Um, why Mr. Putin and the Kremlin went inside a day from talking about uh, traitors and um, attempts to overthrow the state to essentially all charges dropped, um, nothing really to see here. Um, and of course, this morning, you know, very clear attempts to uh, give the impression, at least, of return to normality um, in Moscow and uh, Defence Minister Shoigu you know, appearing on television. But I think the, the best way to understand what's happening here um, is um, a, as a product of the weaknesses and failings of the Russian state um, under Mr. Putin. So weak institutions, strong patronage networks, competing interests within the elite. And the way I've described it in, in the past on many occasions is it's a bit like a tank of piranhas. Um, you know, the piranhas are happy as long as the food keeps coming in. When the food stops coming in, you know, the piranhas eye each other up. What happens next? I think we should see this um, as one act um, in a drama uh, that will continue to run. I don't think we've by any means seen the end of this yet. But so, Ambassador, what, uh, first of all, if, um, you know, Prigozhin wanted to take Moscow, could have he taken it? Again, from the outside, it's very unclear how much support he had from military high-ranking officials. Well, of course, we may never know the answer to that question. Um, what he did do um, was, you know, take to the airwaves openly criticizing the basis of the, uh, the invasion of, of Ukraine, um, you know, the, the idea that it was to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. You know, he then seized control of the Southern Military Command headquarters in Rostov. This is a really, really big deal. Um, and then set off um, you know, with his men um, on a long drive to Moscow. What he planned to do once he got to Moscow, um, it's possible he hadn't even properly thought that through. I mean, the idea that you could turn up in Moscow you know, with even a substantial number of men um, and take the place over. This, this just defies uh, belief, really. Um, and um, as to the deal, I don't know what happened there. Um, again, we may never know the full details of that. What I am sure of, though, um, is that Mr. Putin will not forgive and forget. What does that mean for actually Putin's tenure? Could we actually see him replaced? And we heard from national security intelligence that actually it would be a real problem for many countries around the world as Prigozhin would be the next president, especially if he had the nuclear arms. I mean, he is more unstable and highly volatile even compared to Vladimir Putin. Yeah. I, I think we can pretty much rule out the idea that Mr. Prigozhin will be the next president of Russia. I think what happened over the weekend um, has seriously damaged Mr. Putin. Um, a lot of it, I think, um, is self-harm. Um, you know, he looks damaged, and I think, you know, this is a consequence um, of the way that um, he's come to run Russia in recent years. Um, and I think in his speech on the Saturday morning, his address to the nation on the Saturday morning, uh, the reference to 1917 and the stab in the back was a bad error. I mean, that implies that, you know, Russia is susceptible to some sort of revolution or coup. Absolutely not the message I think he wanted to be spent sending. I mean, um, the idea that um, there might be some sort of palace coup, someone seek to overthrow him, you know, I, I find that quite implausible at the moment. It would be a highly risky venture for anyone to undertake that. Uh, by the way, you know, I, I think it's absolutely implausible that the West would wish to be seen have any hand in this. I mean, the best thing Western governments can do is stay well clear of this. I think what we're now seeing um, is um, a period um, of uncertainty um, and um, uh, um, you know, essentially trying to work out what to do within the Russian system mm -hmm. itself. As regards Russia's so, standing with its, its international partners, again, I think that's quite seriously damaged. I think that people like Xi Jinping will be looking at um, uh, Moscow this morning and just trying to work out what on earth is going on. So, uh, Ambassador, are we going to see changes to either tactically, you know, how <laughs> Russia continues its war in Ukraine or actually changes at the top of the defense ministry? It, was it for, for money that Prigozhin backed away or was it for changes? 
We, we don't know why Prigozhin backed away. I think the things to watch with regard to the war are any impact on morale of the army, uh, the Russian army fighting in Ukraine, any impact on its capabilities. What we will not see, I think, um, is any change in the fundamental goals of Putin and the Russian state. You know, their goal is, is to subjugate or to break um, Ukraine. As regards the, the politics, um, I think what we will uh, see here is a continued period, um, a, a, possibly quite a long period, um, of uncertainty about where things are going. Bear in mind that there is, um, uh, in theory at least, a presidential election due in Russia next year. And whatever the plan for that was, whether it was another term in power for Mr. Putin or some sort of managed succession, I think that just got much harder. Ambassador, do we know how much the, the people inside Russia understand what happened over the weekend? Again, I think there were reports that Russia 24 was, for example, looking at a documentary on Berlusconi at the time. Because if, if Vladimir Putin is weakened, that will affect morale of the troops. Yeah. So the, the Russian state has pretty much total control um, over the TV and radio media. Um, and I'm sure that they will be using that over the coming weeks and months to try and reassert a sense of normality and grip and purpose um, at the top. The bigger question here, I think, um, is the sense that um, there is uh, something just changed, something just happened, and nobody really quite knows what to make of that. What I think the Kremlin's response will be um, will be even deeper repression. We've seen plenty of repression in the last year since the invasion started. I would fully expect that now to double down. Uh, what do we know about what uh, the, the leader in Belarus, what role he has to play? He was involved from the very beginning, but, but this is really taking on a much, much bigger role. So again, there's a great deal we don't know about either the deal or uh, if there was one um, or the means by which it came about. Personally, I find it deeply implausible um, that uh, Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, played um, a brokering role in that. Um, he's not a strong enough figure. Um, he's not taken seriously enough by, I think, any of the main players. Uh, my um, guess is that he was possibly used as a conduit for messages rather than somebody who brokered a deal. Do you think the West ha had any dealing in this? I mean, we're also hearing from various media reports that U.S. intelligence knew about this, did not inform Europe. Then there's, a, you know, a, a second train of thought saying that actually it was probably the West that was behind this. We're not sure to what avail, but do you refute that? There will certainly be um, um, allegations of that in the Russian propaganda over the coming days. Um, and I, over the weekend, um, former President Medvedev uh, pretty much said that, that there were the hands of foreign agencies in this. That's a standard propaganda reaction to try to transfer um, internal tensions and problems onto some sort of external uh, malign forces. I just go back, though, to what Mr. Putin himself said um, on Saturday morning with the reference to 1917 and the reference to traitors from within. Um, you know, that was the way it was being spun on Saturday morning. One point, final point on this, though, it's critically important that Western governments don't feed the fear or the anxiety in Russia that they might be behind this. Um, you know, they, uh, I'm pretty sure they weren't, um, and there is no interest um, in, um, in Western governments in being seen to be playing that role. Uh, Ambassador, is this an advantage for Ukraine, and what does it mean for how they drive the, the war forward? It's, it's certainly positive from Ukraine's point of view, um, but what I would not do um, is make a quick jump from that to um, any um, suggestion that um, the war is nearly over or that Ukraine has a clear strategic advantage on the battlefield. Um, I think they will continue to face a very tough fight. Um, you know, a lot more people, unfortunately, are going to die in that war. We should keep coming back to the fact that, you know, the war was launched illegally and unnecessarily uh, by Mr. Putin against Ukraine. D does it change, though, the, the, the parameters, actually? I mean, one question that I haven't asked you yet is, we always have said in the past that if Vladimir Putin is cornered, you really don't know what he'll do. Do you think he's cornered right now? I wouldn't say he's cornered, and I'd also count, uh, advise against the logic um, that um, you know we should give Putin something of what he wants because you know we might get worse if we don't. I think we're long past the stage where any attempt to uh, appease or buy Mr. Putin off will provide will will lead to better results um, than than essentially facing him down. Nobody wants direct con uh, conflict here between um, NATO and Russia. We don't want it. Russia doesn't want it, and both sides have gone to great lengths so far. 
um, and I think in the future to avoid that happening. But that doesn't change the fundamentals here, um, that what Mr. Putin has done is deeply dangerous, um, certainly to Ukraine, but also to wider European security and stability. Ambassador, thank you so much for all of your insight. Laurie Bristow there, former UK ambassador to Russia. Now to Greece, and it's a landslide victory for Kyriakos Mitsotakis in the country's second vote in just over a month. The win gives the former prime minister a majority big enough to form a single-party government. Now markets have previously rallied behind him as he made the economy central to his campaign. Coming up, more on the short-lived meeting in Russia. We'll be joined by political scientist Ekaterina Shulman. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Yesterday day was rather tense for democratic forces who are in exile and people in Belarus because any weakness of uh, Putin's regime uh, gave us opportunity to uprise uh, again in Belarus. And uh, actually it uh, started uh, this march of Prigozhin started unexpectedly and unexpectedly it was finished. But I'm really uh, honored how uh, Belarusian democratic forces reacted on uh, this event. Uh, the United Transitional Cabinet has created an operation uh, headquarters where major groups and forces have joined. We worked on the common plan of actions. Uh, you know that our goal is to get rid of Russian troops, to dismantle Lukashenko regime and to ensure the transition of democracy. And we really were ready to act uh, yesterday. But now we see that uh, the situation went uh, differently. And now one more threat to Belarusian independence rose because we have heard that uh, Prohoshin can come to Belarus. Yes. And, and, and what do you make of that? Because you say you aspire to a democratic Belarus, but at this point you have Lukashenko, Prigozhin, and the tactical nuclear weapons from Russia. Uh, are you concerned about the future of your country at this point? Look, I'm concerned about the future of my country since 2020, uh, because the, we uh, face a dual crisis at the moment, humanitarian crisis inside the country, because repressions are continuing and intensifying. Thousands of people are in prisons, hundreds of thousands had to flee Belarus, but also we face a threat to our independence. It's because of nuclear weapon and presence of uh, Russian uh, forces uh, in Belarus and now possible um, uh, possible uh, Prigozhin's uh, arrival to uh, our country. Uh, because I, as far as I understand, Prigozhin will likely not come alone, but he uh, will come with his mercenaries. And for them, uh, neither Belarus nor Ukraine should exist. So Prigozhin might be involved in military training, trade of arms, for example. It's not excluded that Prigozhin could be involved in another attack on Ukraine from Belarus territory. Who knows? Well, that was the Belarusian opposition leader expressing her concerns for her country's future after the impact of the Wagner mercenary group's mutiny. Now, coming up, more on this weekend's developments in Russia. We'll have a full roundup of what this means for the next couple of months and beyond. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Wagner mercenary group leader Evgeny Prigozhin dramatically halted his advance towards Moscow after reaching a deal with the Kremlin to end his armed uprising. Now, Prigozhin was once an ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin, but has become a fierce critic of the Russian military for its failures during Moscow's war in Ukraine. Well, Bloomberg's Samuel Etienne reports. Here's Evgeny Prigozhin. The former caterer who went on to lead a powerful mercenary group that marched on Moscow. Born in 1961, Prigozhin was a petty criminal in his early life and was jailed for nearly a decade. He later became a hot dog seller and then involved in several businesses including catering. Through this, Prigozhin became known as Putin's chef, personally serving food to the Russian leader at dinners with dignitaries. The two appeared to share a close relationship. In late 2022, Prigozhin admitted to being the founder and head of Wagner, a Russian private military contractor. 
This after years of denials and even using European courts to sue those who suggested he led the group. The mercenary unit had close links to the Russian military and intelligence community. Wagner, set up eight years earlier in 2014, was utilized in the capture and occupation of eastern Ukraine. Prigozhin's group extended the Kremlin's influence overseas, while allowing Moscow the ability to deny any involvement in any of the group's operations. Wagner has been identified in aiding governments fighting conflicts and stamping out dissent in the Central African Republic, Syria, Libya, Mali and Sudan. Wagner's fighters have been involved in some of the fiercest fighting in Ukraine, notably in the capture of Bakhmut in the east. Prigozhin turned to recruiting criminals from prison with the promise of freedom. Hit by heavy casualties, Prigozhin grew increasingly vocal in his criticism of Russia's conflict in Ukraine and military strategy. The Wagner chief directly blamed Defense Minister Shoigu for a lack of ammunition and weaponry. Prigozhin later claimed Defense Minister Shoigu ordered an airstrike on Wagner troops and retaliated by sending his contractors to take and hold towns in Russia in what he called a march for justice to Moscow. At the time, Vladimir Putin saw this as treason. All those who deliberately embarked on the path of betrayal, who prepared an armed rebellion, embarked on the path of blackmail and terrorist methods. While Prigozhin, later calling off his march, said he was loyal to Putin. As for betraying the motherland, the president was very deeply mistaken. We are patriots of our homeland. We have fought and are fighting. Bloomberg's Samuel Etienne there on the leader of the Wagner Group. Now, we're getting some breaking news out of Brussels. The EU Council actually agreeing on a 3.5 billion euro top-up package to arms fund used for Ukraine. So they've just lifted a ceiling of European peace facility to more than 12 billion euros. Again, it was only four or five days ago before this dramatic weekend that we were here in London looking at the Ukraine, uh, you know, reconstruction fund and now the EU Council has agreed to put more money in it. So let's remind you of a pretty dramatic development over the weekend on Friday. Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner private military group called the Russian military evil in an audio message. The next morning Wagner took control of the Russian military headquarters in the strategically important southern city of Rostov-on-Don. Now President Putin delivered a televised speech and vowed to crush the rebellion. That's as Wagner units headed towards Moscow. Later on Saturday, in a truce brokered by Belarus, Prigozhin said the Wagner column would halt in advance and return to camp. In exchange, Putin guaranteed Prigozhin's safe passage to Belarus and said he would not be prosecuted. The deal also allowed Wagner fighters to join the Russian army. Now, the Kremlin said fighting in Ukraine had not been affected. Now, after a pause from the Fed and a 50 basis point hike from the BOE, top central bankers and policymakers We'll be speaking on the future of monetary policy and inflation. We'll be live from Central Portugal tomorrow and Wednesday for the annual ECB Forum on Central Banks. Now, we'll be speaking to the central bank governors of Latvia, Slovenia and Lithuania tomorrow. We have plenty more exclusives the day after. I'm also looking forward to hearing from Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England. His chief economist, Hugh Pill, will also be there. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Pretty Gupta in New York, Tom McKenzie here in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. An eerie calm falls on Russia after a short-lived mutiny poses the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin's power. Investors assess the risks and the potential for further turmoil. China expresses support for Russian efforts to maintain national stability as the nation's diplomats meet. The yuan weakens as weak consumer spending data adds to the economic gloom. And more bank job cuts. Goldman is dismissing managing directors amid a deal slump, while JP Morgan lets go of investment bankers in North America. 
Welcome to Bloomberg's Valence Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London, stepping in for Danny Berger. Kriti Gupta, of course, in New York. Kriti, what a weekend. Historic in terms of the geopolitics and ruptures in Russia. But arguably, the focus of markets now is on recession risks, is on the reaction function from the central banks, and also slightly weaker, again, data out of China. It absolutely is, but I have to say they're almost connected. The geopolitics we saw over the weekend with, of course, uh, the mood that you were seeing in terms of the inflation, the recessionary talk. The idea here simply being that what could weakness in, in Russia have in a read-through in a time when inflation is still a really big problem, specifically in the commodity complex. Tom, that's going to be a theme we explore throughout the next hour, but to your point, it really is the economic data that's starting to swing the mood here. We're looking at features down about two-tenths of one percent. Again, the theme of recession certainly driving that trade. I'm going to kind of work from the bottom up for a radio audience stick with me here that weak consumer spending data out of China Tom that you mentioned at the top of the show sending the Shanghai composite down one and a half percent the key underperformer in the Asia Pacific index but also dragging down the rest of those Asian benchmarks what's important is what happens in the FX space as well because you are again seeing record weakness in the offshore you want even with that weak consumer uh, data you did see weakness in the offshore in the in the yuan the offshore yuan you saw the PBOC try to step in try to stem that decline and still further weakness ensued 723 on that currency pair but again what is the read through into the European and the American markets well I can tell you Tom in the American markets not a great one you are seeing bonds catch a little bit of a bit already five basis points lower on the 10 year yield we're looking at 368 there combined with that move lower in futures really tells you that the mood is sour indeed. It is. The sentiment has certainly shifted. It may not be overly dramatic here in Europe, but there has been that sentiment turn because at the start, before the open, the futures were pointing to gains of around two tenths, three tenths of percent here in Europe. That's not the way things are shaping out. Of course, about two hours into the trading session, there's pain being felt here in the FTSE MIB over in Italy, down around nine tenths of a percent. Here in the UK, off six tenths of a percent. Over in France, losses of five tenths of a percent. Building on the losses, by the way, of a little over two percent across European equities last week. So the question is, is this profit taking or is this the start of a more sustained downturn? You had the IFO sentiment survey coming out of Germany just underscoring the weakness in Europe's largest economy. The sentiment survey there dropping to the lowest level all year. And of course, we had that surprise softness in the PMI data of last week as well. So the recession concerns front and centre. We have inflation data out of Europe later this week. And of course, tuning in for ECB officials who are meeting in Portugal's central Sintra as well for an important summit. Of course, Jay Powell will be there as well. So the benchmark is down currently in the session, five tenths of percent here in Europe. We're focused on bonds because, of course, there has been a move in to the longer dated part of sovereign debt. In terms of the yield inversion in Europe, the most pronounced that we've seen in decades, the most pronounced when it comes to UK gilts, by the way, since about 2000. Euro dollar 108 after the pressure that felt last week, again, on those recession concerns. And HSBC, just pulling this story out for you, it's not going to be really linked to the news story, but it's an interesting one. It's currently down eight tenths of percent. That's because financials as a sector are taking a big hit. But HSBC and the work from home story, they are looking to move out of their iconic tower, more than 40 stories in Canary Wharf and potentially moving to St. Paul's by 2026. Just an iconic move there and work from home is part of that shift for HSBC. Critty. You know, it's fascinating to see that those kind of moves are actually having an impact on the stock, Tom. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that sustains in the weeks and month ahead. But let's go back to the main story over the weekend, the geopolitics front and center. The impact of the Wagner mercenary groups mutiny and subsequent backing down is being assessed around the world. For more analysis, let's bring in Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Maria, a extraordinary weekend, a historic one, if I can say that. Is the crisis over for Vladimir Putin? Is, is everything back to normal for him? Uh, look, it's, it's very difficult to gauge because the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin himself, they've gone radio silent on this topic. Remember the last time we saw uh, Vladimir Putin, it was on the Saturday morning where he said the country was witnessing and experiencing essentially treason and he talked about fatal consequences. Now what we know is that uh, Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, decided to pull back. He appears to be alive and on his way uh, to Belarus, Lukashenko, the head of Belarus, says he brokered uh, this 
deal between Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin, but the details of it continue to be very murky. What is, however, uh, very much working and kicking this morning is the Kremlin PR machine. Just this morning, we had footage from Sergei Shoigu, that is the defense minister of Russia, on a helicopter. He appeared to be inspecting uh, Russian troops in the war in Ukraine. Of course, a lot of this signaling that it is back to normal, but again, there's no information on when the tape uh, was recorded, and we know that a lot of the issues between Prigozhin, Wagner, and Shoigu, and the MOD uh, have been a, or a source of tension, excuse me, for months. Is it over for Vladimir Putin? Well, the top European diplomat this morning suggesting he has created a monster, that monster has come back to haunt him, and no matter what happens now, his image as a man that controls everything has been rattled already. Amiria, of course, a lot of questions about Prigozhin, a lot of questions about the, the deal and what this means. And, of course, it was negotiated by Belarus. He is apparently going to be heading there in terms of exile. But you've been speaking to a really important person in terms of the connections around the politics of Belarus and their views. Just underscore or at least explain for us what's being said by the opposition leaders there. Uh, yes, and just to recap, on the Saturday, Alexander Lukashenko, the leader of uh, Belarus, although, again, we should note and stress the international community has pointed out many times they believe he rigged uh, the 2020 election. He has a relationship with Vladimir Putin that goes back years, uh, decades. This is, at times, a very transactional relationship. He announced that he had mediated between the two men and cut a deal that now sees Prigozhin heading to uh, Belarus. I did speak with the head of the opposition, uh, Svetlana Chikanuskaya, and she told me, Lukashenko's not a hero, he's not a mediator, and if you think he's doing this for the good of his heart, you're probably wrong. Let's take a look. We face a threat to our independence. It's because of nuclear weapon and presence of uh, Russian uh, forces uh, in Belarus and now possible um, uh, possible uh, Prigozhin's uh, arrival to uh, our country. Uh, because I, as far as I understand, Prigozhin will likely not come alone, but he uh, will come with his mercenaries. And for them, uh, neither Belarus nor Ukraine should exist. So Prigozhin might be involved in military training, trade of arms, for example. It's not excluded that Prigozhin could be involved in another attack on Ukraine from Belarus territory. Who knows? And that was Vitlana Chikanuskaya. Remember, she challenged Lukashenko in the 2020 election. She had to go into exile. Her husband is in prison to this date as we speak. And again, she pointed out this uh, move from Prigozhin now adds another threat to the independence and the sovereignty of her country, Belarus. Maria Tadeo in Brussels, all over that story. From every angle, I might ask, the European side, the Russian side, of course, the Belarus side as well. We thank you, as always. And sticking with the fallout there, the market fallout, oil is advancing as investors weigh the potential for more turmoil in Russia after their dramatic but short-lived rebellion in the major OPEC plus producer over the weekend. In the meantime, Saudi Aramco CEO Ami Nasser says, despite the recession risks in several OECD countries, the economies of developing countries, especially China and India, are driving a healthy the oil demand growth of more than 2 million barrels per day this year. This is high by historical standards, he says. Joining us now to discuss the impact on the commodities complex is Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. Will, to see the fallout in the oil prices at a time when we're also getting weak consumer data, how do you square the, I want to say, two, three major factors this morning in the oil market? Well, clearly, uh, what happened in Russia over the weekend uh, is of huge importance to the oil market. Russia uh, produces more than 10 million barrels a day, one in every 10 barrels globally, um, and it exports more than 80% of that. So it's absolutely crucial, and I think traders uh, will be very alive to the possible threats uh, posed by increasing turmoil inside Russia. But it's worth saying that there has been no impact on oil production. Um, and one of the most salient features of the oil market since the war in Ukraine started has how Russia has been able to maintain production and indeed get that production to global markets. Uh, after a blip last summer, uh, exports are riding high. Um, they've rejigged the direction of those exports towards Asia, principally China and India. Uh, but uh, it, it's adding to the, to the uh, overall supply balance, which uh, despite the demand factors that Amin Nasser mentions, uh, the world has ample supply from Russia and elsewhere. Uh, Will, what about when it comes to soft commodities? There's still this kind of visceral sensitivity to, to higher food prices. We saw wheat popping. We were speaking to Saxo Bank, Oli Hansen, 
over there, the strategist around commodities, he says actually you should be focused on wheat in terms of the reaction function to risks in Russia. I mean, Russia, uh, like oil, remains absolutely crucial to the global food system, as you say. It's an enormously important uh, wheat exporter, and a lot of those exports come through the Black Sea, come through areas like Rostov, where we saw a lot of the action over the weekend. So, indeed, if there is more political turmoil in Russia, then you could have an impact on wheat exports. And then in the background, you have this continuing debate over the agreement to allow uh, exports of wheat from Ukraine, which is always bubbling away in the background with whether Russia will continue to honour that agreement or walk back on it. So there are clear risks there. But I think it's worth saying again uh, that the market reaction this morning remains fairly muted, which I think reflects that although there are heightened risks, heightened uh, political uh, possibilities in the future, right now those key flows of commodities from Russia are continuing. OK, Will Kennedy, on that relatively muted response from the commodity markets as production and exports continue around oil and, of course, soft commodities as well as we weigh up those potential future risks. Now, more job cuts, switching focus to the banking sector. Four big banks. Goldman Sachs has started cutting managing directors across the globe. JP Morgan, meanwhile, cutting about 40 investment bankers in North America. Joining us now is Bloomberg Finance reporter Tom Metcalf. Tom, uh, what do we make of these, these cuts? This is a steady kind of drip, drip of cutting to the bone for some of these banks. Is there more to come? Yeah, that's exactly right. This is one of sort of a series of, of cuts we've been reporting on. Uh, you know, at Goldman, 125 managing directors across the world. Some of them will be in investment banking. And yeah, look, my takeaway is this is not sort of the end or anything like that. I suspect there'll be plenty more of these stories going forward just because that deal-making business, there really is not uh, any kind of deal flow in there. So, you know, this is how the banks are going to respond. They're going to be looking to cut costs. Uh, and it's definitely a big downturn for this part of, of the investment banking world. Yeah, the cuts certainly accelerating around the world. Tom, I want to stick with the banking story here because uh, in your illustrious career, Bloomberg, you also spent some time in San Francisco. I want to talk to you about the developments around the remnants of Silicon Valley Bank. What has stood out to you? What's the surprise here? Yeah, I absolutely love this story um, about, you know, who are the people who benefited uh, from the SVB's rescue. And yes, of course, while plenty of smaller tech firms did, the thing that jumped out from our, our story was, you know, it was Sequoia. You know, that is absolutely top tier venture capital firm. They had something like a billion dollars uh, on deposit at SVB. And, you know, for me, that's the really interesting thing is whenever when you have these kind of mass rescues, it turns out that, you know, it's people who maybe didn't really need that who, who get it. So you had Sequoia, you also had a, a Beijing based tech firm as well with something like 900 million on deposit. Again, that all got sort of guaranteed by the US government. Wow, a billion dollars in deposit from Sequoia and SVB. Tom Metcalf, thank you very much indeed running us through and rounding up the top banking news for us. Now, coming up, Callum Pickering, senior economist at Berenberg, joins us. We'll be talking about the Russia geopolitics, the impact on the global economy, but also, of course, weaker Europe and inflation data coming up. And US stocks are now at a real juncture. That is the view of Stifle's Richard Kneller. More on that still ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Tom McKenzie in London. Global markets staying relatively muted as investors assess a weekend of geopolitical turmoil. Joining us now, Callum Pickering, senior economist over at Berenberg. Callum, you picked a perfect day to join us because there's so many different cross currents coming from various economies. Let's start with the Russia news, though. As we see the readout in the commodity space at a time when inflation is still top of mind, how big of a deal is this when you're kind of factoring it into your economic models? It's not easy to see actually at the moment what the consequences are. I think if at the weekend on Saturday certainly looked like we had something very significant happening, it didn't happen. Um, so markets now need to contemplate what the future holds. I mean, the, the issue is, quite, is, is around Putin. Um, how secure is he? Does that affect the course of the war? Does the uncertainty on the, on the Russian side affect the way Ukraine can conduct its counteroffensive? But you know, there's this phrase that you often hear, the, the, the fog of war. I think that's as high as it's ever been, and markets will have a very hard time gaming the various scenarios. Um, I don't really think that there's anything material in the news that markets can take risk on on this, on this moment, in this, at this time. 
Callum, is that a function simply of the sanctions that have been placed on the Russian economy? Is it this idea that the read through that perhaps markets were watching a year or so ago just don't apply anymore because of those steps taken? Yes, there's an element of that. And also, I would just keep in mind, most of the advanced world now is basically uncoupled from the Russian economy. The, the adjustment in the energy sectors and the food sectors has now almost completely made. We still have some legacy effects on prices. Most of the economic issues that the Western world has to deal with are now homegrown, namely the inflation problem, which is, of course, is an echo of the war. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequence, but it's not currently related. Um, near term, actually, War is never good. There's uncertainty around certainly some of the very significant tail risks. How does a, a less strong than expected Putin actually react to this? Uh, but the most important thing is we're actually learning to sort of live with the risk of war. Uh, economies have by and large functioned better than expected. The inflation seems to be a little bit worse. So again, the news at the weekend is potentially material for the course of the war, but it's not easy to see what the economic and market read through should be at this stage. And Europe, of course, is delinked largely from, yes. from, from Russian oil and gas. And there was an expectation that Germany would be very badly hit towards the end of last year. It got through the winter. Now That's the right. data is looking pretty unfavorable. We know it was in recession in the first yep. quarter. The IFO sentiment survey out today, again, the lowest level that we've seen yep. year to date. Is it base case now for you and the team at Berenberg that are going to see a recession in Europe? And how deep is that recession likely to be? No recession in Europe. Of course, there's significant downside risks, stagnation for a few more quarters mm. at still high. But no recession. rates of inflation but still no recession in the US there's probably likely to be a Fed engineered mini recession uh, we need to just split the two issues again I think it's useful as, as, as your colleague just mentioned let's go back a year ago the expectation was uh, two phases of pain heading into last winter you get the pain from the energy stock huge terms of trade shock the second phase of pain is monetary policy those long and variable lags when do they start to kick in the first phase Europe managed much better than expected. No genuine shortages, yes, a big price shock, a big terms of trade shock, but relative to initial expectations for a recession, mere stagnation turned out to be a very good outcome. Now the question is, what does the monetary policy, the lagged effect of that have on economies? Just keep in mind that the reason why economies have been better than expected is demand has been much more resilient. And so when you try and factor in a negative shock for monetary policy, in a context of, uh, of, of strong demand, it may just be that net-net you get stagnation for a while. And actually, that's the base case. The risk here is that if inflation risks seem to persist, central banks then go too far, and then you get that recession. But we seem to be tolerating higher interest rates much better than expected. I don't see any reason to justify a recession just well, yet. On, on those potential risks of ECB, for example, going yep. too far, markets now pricing in around 3.9%, so yep. sub-4%. Do you see sub-4% in terms of the terminal rate from the ECB? And are the doves now going to have more grist to the mill in terms of the data that's coming through to push back on some of the, some of the hawks pushing for more and for longer? It, it, it's complicated because there's a real trade-off here between reacting to near-term information, which is always very uncertain. Yeah. Predicting monthly CPI is impossible. Just look at the trouble the Bank of England is having. And knowing what the policy will do over a 12-month period when it comes to inflation. I think from the ECB we get one, maybe two more hikes. Um, the question is then, uh, can central banks hold their nerve if you face near-term upside surprises when it comes to CPI? As we've seen in the UK, the Bank of England is not holding its nerve. Uh, will the ECB, will the Fed? That's an open question. The risk here is that with the lags to monetary policy, if you react to potential near-term upside surprises and you go another 50 or even 100 basis points, then you overcorrect, correct. And then next year or later this year, then you start to see that recession. The risk that markets should just keep in mind is central banks say that they're forward looking, but they react far too much to incoming economic data and they're backward looking in their assessment too often. And so we over eased in 2020, 2021. We probably did the right thing last year. And now the risk is that we over tighten to the degree that central banks go way too far. Uh, then we have to raise a recession call. But to the extent that, sent, that the economy seems to be tolerating higher interest rates, yeah. if we get to five in the UK, four in, in the Eurozone, and they hold their nerve, probably we, we don't see any economic risk from that.
Well, speaking of the economic risk, let's talk about the other region we haven't hit yet, which is China. This weak consumer spending data just adding to the deluge of yep. weaker data you're getting out of China. Massive market reaction off of that overnight. What is the read through into Europe, into the United States when the Chinese reopening trade is still not fully uh, at play here? Is it the same read through, say, that we would have gotten 15 years ago? So, so the, the first thing I would just mention for Europe, it's not so much the Chinese consumer that matters for exports, it's actually investment. When China has strong investment, it sucks in a lot of capital goods from abroad and it sucks in a lot of European capital goods. And so far, the disappointment for, for Europe has not so much been the Chinese consumer, but it's been China investment, which has been weak. Now, what I would just say at this stage is, if consumers in China remain weak, that will increase the probability that the Chinese authorities respond. They can do that through the monetary channel, they can do that through the fiscal channel. And so what we might see actually in the course of this is if China consumer is weak enough for a policy reaction on the fiscal side and you get much more investment into the second half of this year and into next year, then you might see actually after a short term negative surprise to global trade because of weak China, you then get an upside surprise once that investment starts up. Okay, so watching that reaction to a potentially weaker and maybe sustain weaker Chinese okay. consumer. Callum Pickering, thank you very much indeed. Hitting the Russia effect, of course, the ECB central bank impact and what to watch when it comes to China's still under pressure economy. Thank you very much indeed, of course, of Berenberg. Now, staying with the Europe story and the politics now, Greece's Mitsotakis has scored a landslide victory in Sunday's general election. Greece's new electoral system awards as many as 50 seats to the winner, meaning he's set to get 158 members in the 300-seat chamber. And it's going to allow him to form a single party government and investor friendly policies is what, of course, he's going to be hoping to implement. Critty, given where we were with Greece, what, 12, 13 years ago, Greece now standing out across the European political space as a kind of bastion of political stability. You've got another four years of the market friendly Mitsotakis. I know, the irony that we're worried about Russia, China, and the rest of Europe, but Greece seems to have it together, really stands out. To me, the market reaction is what's interesting here, because if you look at the mm. investment standpoint, they're outperforming on the equities front, on the bond front. Who would have thought yeah. 15 years ago that if you buy Greek bonds in 2023, you'd be outperforming the rest of the world? Athens Stock Exchange up more than 36% year to date. In unemployment has, what, halved? It's about 15% from about 36%. Uh, percent. So they've done well on that. The next thing to watch, and it's something, of course, the government in Athens is determined to achieve, is getting the ratings agencies to improve the rating, of course, on sovereign debt. Currently junk level, and it's been at that rating for about 13 years. The ratings agencies are expected to reassess in the second half of this year. And if it moves out of junk rated territory, well, that is going to be... Another feather in the cap for Mr. Takis. Yeah, well, one of the concerns of that, though, is just how sustainable this growth is, because at the end of the day, yeah. a good chunk of that Greek growth is coming from tourism, from the United States, from Europe as well. But in a kind of downturn or in a recession that we've been expecting for two years or so now, how long does that growth really sustain? I think there are going to be geopolitical consequences to that as well, given that Mr. Takis's main pillars and platforms that he kind of won on was that economic growth. They have a capital account deficit that they need to deal with. They have a majority, but he's still got these right-wing parties that are going to be in Parliament potentially nipping at his heels and causing pressure, particularly on questions, controversial questions like immigration as well. So politically, the pressure is still going to be there for Mitsotakis, even as he has a majority. But as you say, it's significant, of course, into those of the, the, the makeup and the fabric of, of European politics. And we'll see how he puts his cabinet together as well in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that crucial piece that you just mentioned, which is the immigration policy as well. Note that last week uh, there was, of course, that tragic uh, capsizing of the boat off the Mediterranean coast. There were concerns that that would weigh on his platform as well, Tom. Looks like it didn't enough uh, in light of the economic success. Yeah, indeed. OK, coming up, markets assessing a weekend, of course, of geopolitical turmoil. If you put Greece to one side, we're going to have more on that. The focus, of course, on Russia. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. An eerie calm falls on Russia after a short-lived mutiny poses the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin's power. Investors assess the risks and the potential for further turmoil. China expresses support for Russian efforts to maintain national stability as the nation's diplomats meet. The yuan weakens as weak consumer spending data adds to the economic gloom. And more bank job cuts. Goldman is dismissing managing directors amid a deal slump, while J.P. Morgan lets go of investment bankers in North America. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Tom McKenzie in London. Tom, a lot to digest. Inflation, recession, still on top of mind. But i got to say, I think geopolitics takes the cake today. Well, geopolitics is certainly driving the interest, isn't it? Certainly on the terminal, the determination, of course, to find out what is going on, what that deal means between Putin and the head of the Wagner Group, of course, following that mutiny, or at least attempted mutiny over the weekend. When it comes to the markets, though, as you touched on, as you nodded to, arguably, it's more about the data, it's more about recession risks, and it's more about the determination of these central banks to go higher and longer on interest rates. As we look ahead to Sintra and that symposium where we're going to hear from Jay Powell, we're going to hear from Malam Lagarde, we're going to hear from Andrew Bailey of the BOE. European equities are down four-tenths of a percent. So building on the losses that we saw last week, plus two percent was the downside for European stocks last week. The euro, by the way, which also took a hit on the back of softer data out of Europe, particularly the PMIs, down 108, currently 108 after the hit of last week. The EFO sentiment survey out of Germany, the business sentiment survey dropping to the lowest level year to date, really underscoring the continued fragility around the German economy struggling to move on from that recession that we know it notched in the first quarter. Money moving into the long end then around German bonds of the 10-year. You've got yields down five basis points, 230 as German long-end debt remains bid. HSBC, just one corporate to bring to your attention, they are potentially looking to move out of their iconic Canary Wharf headquarters in the city of London, currently down five tenths of percent, moving as work from home is readjusting how much space they think they need. Critty, what is the setup looking like for U.S. then? Well, I have to say, I think the micro story, the churn that you're seeing in the banking sector, not having as much of a read through stateside right now, is pretty much mostly macro. And I have to say, perhaps Asia driven as well. We mentioned that weak consumer spending data out of China specifically. Well, it's send the Chinese uh, Shanghai Composite Index down one and a half percent, taking the entire Asian Pacific benchmark lower as well. But then you also saw some record weakness in the offshore you want. Again, the PBOC trying to step in, stemming that decline. It didn't quite work. So we're really seeing dollar uh, yuan at about 723 when you're looking at the offshore trading there. The read through is interesting because again, Tom, you mentioned it, the recession concerns, the growth concerns, that seems to be weighing on futures, which by the way, overnight opened positive, perhaps in light of the Russia news. Futures down about uh, two tenths, we'll call one to two tenths of one percent. The 10 year yield is what's interesting though, because it is 5 30 a.m. in New York, and already you are seeing about a four to five basis point move lower, perhaps following the action you are seeing in those boons, as you just pointed out. 369, Tom, on that 10 year yield. Okay, let's get back to that geopolitical story then. The ruptures, of course, in Russia. Vladimir Putin faced what was the biggest challenge to his two decade rule with, of course, that short-lived mutiny. Wagner mercenary group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin halted his fighter's advance toward Moscow as part of a deal brokered by Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko to end the 24-hour revolt. Joining us for more is Bloomberg's Mark Champion, who is in Kyiv. Mark, just get up to speed on where things stand and what we know, if anything, about this deal and whether or not it's likely to hold. Right. Um, so essentially, we know very little about the content of the deal. We do know that uh, uh, Prigozhin stood down. He had uh, several thousand troops on their way to Moscow. Uh, he stopped. They dispersed. And we don't know where he is now. Uh, he has gone incommunicado. Uh, according to his press people, they say that he'll get back online as soon as he's in a normal communications position. So we don't know where he is. Um, as to the deal, we know that the, the, there's some element where the Wagner troops will be offered the possibility in amnesty and a, a, a possibility of uh, signing contracts with the regular army. Um, but beyond that, we don't know much. Uh, he, you know, uh, Prigozhin had several demands. Um, one of them included the resignation of Defense Minister Shoigu, and Shoigu was shown on TV this morning uh, visiting troops in Ukraine. So. Um, it, we really don't know uh, what happened there. We don't know actually if you know we are at the beginning or the end of uh, this particular uh, cycle. So we could we could see some more surprises. Yeah. Uh, we just don't know. 
Mark, you're on the ground, of course, for us in Kyiv. You've been there an, a number of weeks. What, what is your sense of how, in terms of how the initiative is unfolding for, for the Ukrainian armed forces as they, as they pursue this offensive? Does it, does it play to their advantage? How, how is it all affecting operations on the ground? Well, they absolutely hope that it will. Um, their calculation is that anything that's bad for Putin, anything that uh, disturbs uh, the regime, uh, makes them focus on internal issues, uh, has got to be good for Ukraine, has got to be eventually play some sort of role on the battlefield. Um, whether that's the case, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Um, so far, uh, the, the sort of daily news uh, of what's going on doesn't show any direct link uh, to uh, events in Russia. Um, every day there are movements by either side. Um, the Ukrainians, as you say, are in counteroffensive in the south. They're pursuing that. Um, but there's no uh, sudden move that looks very different from what had been happening in previous days. Mark, so that is the kind of physical movements of, of the key players there. Talk to us a little bit about the disinformation campaign. I think something that really stood out to me in terms of his kind of resume is that in 2016, with the meddling of the U.S. elections, he was one of the people to implement that disinformation campaign. What does disinformation look like now relative to this issue? Well, you know, so the, the, the Kremlin is... is trying to portray business as usual, um, but it's really been punctured. And he moved way off script by, uh, you know, by, by attempting uh, this, not a coup. I mean, as far as we know, he said it wasn't a coup attempt. Um, as far as we know, uh, it wasn't. What he wanted really uh, was that he runs this big mercenary group, Wagner. They're very, uh, they make a lot of money. They have a lot of power in, in Africa. But they've also been very involved in Ukraine. And the threat to him was that Wagner was going to be dismantled and he would lose his, his money, his base, his everything. Uh, so uh, he made this move exactly what he wanted. We can't be sure. Publicly, he said he wanted the resignations of these various officials that he's been feuding with for the past months. Um, and, uh, you know, so beyond that, we don't know a, a great deal about what, uh, you know, was going on in, in private conversations. Mark Champion reporting live on the ground for us in Kyiv. We thank you as always and stay safe. We look forward to what you have to report. For more analysis, let's bring in Ekaterina Shulman. She is a political scientist specializing in the legislative process in modern Russia. Pleasure to have you on the show. Walk us through this dynamic that Mark just laid out here. The idea that he claims this wasn't a coup attempt against Vladimir Putin himself, but rather against the defense minister. Shed a little light on the dynamic between Prigozhin and the defense minister Shoigu. It did look more like a business deal operated through military means than any political move, frankly. Uh, the popular description of Russia as a gas station posing as a country is, of course, unfair, but that we do have a chain of shady business operations masquerading as political leadership may be closer to truth. Uh, it is true that Prigozhin's rhetoric was mostly aimed against uh, Defense Minister and the head of General Headquarters, Gerasimov, but recently uh, some of the things he said seemed to point directly to the president and his public description of this March for Justice, which was the name he, he gave to uh, his personal private offensive, was that we should stop living under corruption, dysfunctionality, etc. And this was a description of political system in general, rather than at something uh, dysfunctional uh, at the defense ministry. So he was trying to create some sort of public political position for himself. He even before that uh, attempted coup or, or a mutiny, to be more exact, he made a tour for, uh, across Russian regions, meeting people, uh, making speeches, and looking all in all like a potential presidential campaign. But that, again, was based on his dissatisfaction with the way he was treated. If we listen to what he says, he said, we had a lucrative business in Africa, we, Wagner, the private military company, but then motherland was in danger. They asked us to help. We helped, but yeah. they're not treating us fairly. And now they want to dismantle Wagner. So either pay us or let us go back to Africa to make money. Again, it was all very much uh, in the open. So there was the business right. part and there was a the political part.
judging by the events of um, this weekend, the business part kind of uh, won over the uh, political. I love that you talked about it as a kind of through the business lens, of course, given that we're a financial network. Talk to us about Prigozhin's future here specifically. You talked about the potential unwinding of the Wagner network. For Prigozhin, is it really likely that he remains kind of this millionaire in Minsk? How, what does his future look mm -hmm. like? I don't think we should concern ourselves with his personal future. What I would be looking at is the fate of the institution, Wagner, the private military company, which is, by the way, not the only private military company in Russia, but by far the most public one. So what was happening during these last weeks can be generally described as an attempt on the part of Ministry of Defense to get back all the armed forces under its wing. So the regulars were trying to get rid of the irregulars by either absorbing them or dealing with them otherwise. Uh, you should remember how the Deputy Minister of Defense declared that by July the 1st, all the so-called volunteers, which are actually mercenaries, should sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense and so become regular contracted soldiers under the Defense Ministry. And Prigozhin refused very publicly to do this, even after the President seconded this order by saying that it is really for the good of the soldiers so that they can have social guarantees uh, from the state, etc. So they should sign the contract. But Prigozhin said, no, we're not going to do that, using in his very descriptive language uh, the phrase, we will not go the, down by the path of dishonor which is colorful. So yeah. that was the, the nucleus of, of the conflict. Now what we want to see is what happens to Wagner. Are they mm. being dismantled? Are some people, will some people be prosecuted for whatever, for mutiny or for other crimes connected with the things they usually do? Will they be made to sign contracts or maybe given a choice of either signing contracts or going home scot-free? So this is, this is interesting rather than what happens to Prigozhin personally. People of his okay. um, business model rarely die mm. a natural death. Wow, yes, I mean, history bears that out, doesn't it? At least recent history in Russia. Uh, Ekaterina, on, I didn't want to shift, so focus on what happens with Wagner, and that'll give us a tell in terms of maybe the success of Putin to absorb that military group in, into the traditional Russian army and whether or not that indeed kind of shores up some of his political support. But on the political support or lack of it for, for Putin, I just want to reference one of our Bloomberg opinion columnists, Leonard Bershisky, and I'm this is one of the quotes that stands out from his piece. Putin has not, for the first time, but at a critical moment, shown weakness. Even though Prigozhin didn't win, his anarchical mutiny move exposed the regime's brittleness to all who might want to exploit it. The emperor is naked. How exposed is Vladimir Putin at this point, Ekaterina? Of course, it's hard to interpret the events of this weekend in any other way as a sign of weakness or, in the language of political science, autocratic fragility, which is one of uh, our basic concepts, but hard to explain sometimes to people because what autocracies do is they project the image of strength, maybe ruthlessness, effectiveness, stability, whatever, but uh, they're really quite fragile. They cannot... Um, do power transfers. They cannot do power transits the way democracies can do it. They are very much dependent on personalities, and when something happens to mm. these personalities, systems tend to fall apart. So it's, it's exotic uh, to look at, but really mm. it's, it's quite typical. It's something out of textbook. But uh, for the moment, the president is in his place. Uh, this, is the, this is the most we can say. Yeah. Uh, what I would be expecting to see is the emergence of some group who will claim to have saved the motherland, or at least the president, from this armed mutiny. Who will be the saviors of the, of the nation? I think we mm. will see it if we see some personal changes. So far, okay. the Minister of Defense has tried to step to the public front and project this business as usual image that you have mentioned earlier. But w will there be changes in the Defense Ministry? Will there be changes in the FSB, for example? Mm. Uh, many 
Well, many insiders have named yeah. the Tula region governor Alexei Dumin as a kind of person who somehow managed to stop the march on Moscow. Because it is true that the column, the Wagner's column, stopped yeah. uh, about 200 kilometers uh, okay. from, from Moscow, Ekaterina. which is which, which is Tula region. Ekaterina. Yes. We, we're running out of time, but we appreciate your insights and what to watch in the days and weeks ahead when it comes to the politics of Russia and the fate of Putin. That is Russian political scientist Ekaterina Scholman, an associate fellow at Chatham House. Thank you. Coming up, we're going to speak to Richard Neller, US equities desk strategist at Stifle, how to position in this environment. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. There's a lot to digest over the weekend and perhaps a very real read through when it comes to the economy and of course the U.S. stock market as well. Let's break it all down. Richard Neller from the U.S. Equities Desk strategist over at Stiefel joins us bright and early this morning. A pleasure to have you on the show, Richard. Look, let's tie the geopolitics and the economics together. I'm, I'm a history buff, though, so bear with me. One of my favorite kind of reference points to look at, especially in the context of the war in Ukraine, was back in the 60s when you had a massive nine-month bear market, 1962, and the trigger that turned it around in the U.S. stock market was the ending of the Cuban Missile Crisis. What kind of positivity out of the war in Ukraine and the potential weakness in Russia, could that be a sustainable tailwind for the U.S. equity market? Good morning. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's beyond fascinating what's happening in, in Russia. And, you know, I'm not a geopolitical strategist or political scientist. I was listening to your, your prior guest. I think, as I was thinking about it over the weekend, and I was actually surprised that the Asian markets overnight didn't react more. Um, I think you probably have to break it down, at least the way I'm thinking about this. And of course, this is all fluid. But they're sort of you know short, medium, and, and and longer term. I think in the short to medium term, um, if there is the perception, which seems to be from the West, that Putin is weakened by this, that the regime is uh, ever at risk, then of course the logical deduction is that that's beneficial to uh, the Ukrainians as there's internal strife within Russia. I would think the longer term ramifications are that should this be a catalyst or move towards uh, Putin's regime toppling or imploding, and U Ukraine winning, then, you know, what is the vacuum that follows it? And you mentioned, you know, you're a history buff. I'm also a popcorn history buff as well. And we know that after key you know, historic events, um, vacuums fill. And the issue is, therefore, what, what follows that? Now, that's the unknown at this point. As it pertains mm -hmm. to... US equity markets or global equity markets, I think uh, there's that short, medium and term, uh, longer term view. Um, and Richard, moment, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you want to be starting to position? Do you start to put in some positions around an enfeebled Vladimir Putin, around the potential prospect of a Ukrainian victory and the upside that may come through that across, across equities, or is it too soon? I think it's still too soon. This is all very fluid. But nevertheless, if it seems over the coming days and weeks that Russia's on the back foot, that the Ukrainian push, the, the, the counteroffensive starts to get momentum, um, I would think markets would, would, would like that across the board. And the marginal dollar will probably go into more risky assets relative to defensive assets. That would be my instinct at this point, but I'll defer more to you know, political scientists but uh, as I said, it's all it's, it's, it's early days and it's fluid, but it's, it's beyond fascinating. Um, Richard, just very quickly on, on Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley's call that the headwinds are just too great for these U.S. equity markets. Do you, do you want to be taking profit at this point? I think the index upside is limited here. The work that we've done, we actually recently raised our S&P target, uh, actually in early May, to 4,400. Um, our positioning, the chief U.S. equity strategist who I work with here at Stiefel, Barry Bannister, um, we've been far more tactical and really the other side of the trade since last autumn. At 43.50 or wherever we are at the moment, roughly, mm. I, I think there's limited index upside. Uh, 
the person that you referenced at Morgan Stanley, I, I know one of his big calls is about the you know S and P earnings falling mm. well below 200. I mean, we're at 204, and we're looking for flat year on year. Uh, consensus okay. has been moving down, so I think the index upside is okay. limited here. The work that I do is where I'm thinking about into the second half and 24, where one should be relatively more positioned in a defensive sense. OK, Richard Neller, really appreciate your insights on the geopolitics and U.S. equities in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you from Stiefel, of course. Coming up, the Activision Microsoft FTC hearing continues this week. We're going to have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Tom McKenzie in London. Look, Tom, $70 billion at stake here, mm. at least a deal between Microsoft and Activision. We saw some pushback from the UK, and now we're getting pushback in the US as well. I want to walk you through the story, Tom, because it is fascinating to me. We are in the middle of an FTC kind of court injunction. They requested uh, the federal courts to pull and delay the U.S. Uh, kind of Activision approval process for Microsoft uh, to, to get onto the $70 billion deal. You are seeing a little bit of pushback here on simply the idea that maybe this deal might not go through. The leader of the kind of legal team of the Microsoft side saying if there is some sort of delay, it's going to take three years to kind of navigate and therefore the deal just might not be worth it. I can kind of quickly bring about yeah. the other side of this equation very very quickly, we did get some comments from the PlayStation CEO owned by Sony pushing back against the exclusivity of the Xbox seal. He's saying, well, maybe exclusivity isn't an issue here, and that's something that's being played out in court at the moment. It was a fascinating image painted by the reporting of the head of videos at Microsoft putting his hand up, holding his hand up in court and saying, I pledge that we will not be blocking Call of Duty and the sales of Call of Duty to Sony and others. It is a story worth watching. That's it for early edition. Of course, surveillance is up next with Ian Bremner and many other top guests. This is Bloomberg.